Uh, thank you to our members and our guests for attending our public session here today on media. And our roundtable discussion is with RTE, the National Union of Journalists and the Independent Broadcasters of Ireland to discuss the future of public service broadcasting and the impact of COVID-19 on the media sector. I'd like to request members to sit only in the seats permitted and in front of the available microphones to ensure they are heard. It is important uh, as not doing so causes serious problems with broadcasting, editorial and sound staff. I would like to remind you to please maintain social distance at all times during and following our meeting. Members are requested to use wipes and hand sanitizers provided to clean the seats and desks shared to supplement regular sanitization in the breaks between meetings. And I do know that uh, our, uh, last week there's always the, I suppose, um, enticement and to, to stay talking to our guests after the meeting. So there are other committee members coming in, or other committee meetings happening after ours, so I would encourage members that we uh, retire to the lobby there if we want to have a discussion with our guests afterwards, which you're more than welcome to do. But rather than hanging around in here, I would ask us to vacate the room and leave the room free for the sanitisation that needs to happen. First, I'd like to welcome to the meeting Mr Adrian uh, Lynch, Director of Audience, Channels and Marketing in RTE, Mr Seamus Dooley. Irish Secretary, National Union of Journalists, and Mr John Purcell of Independent Broadcasters Ireland. Uh, Mr Lynch, Mr Dooley and Mr Purcell are here today to discuss the future of Irish broadcasting and the impact of COVID-19 to our meeting. Uh, to our guests, I'm sure you've already noted that um, our witnesses are to make an opening statement not longer than three minutes each, and it will be followed by questions from the members of the committee. As you are probably aware, the committee may publish the opening statements on its website following the meeting. So, Adrian, and if I can begin with you, we'll follow with uh, Mr Dooley and finally to John Purcell. Before I begin, can I remind members of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such way as they, or he or she can be identifiable. I would like the witnesses to note that you are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the presentation you make in the committee. This means that you have an absolute defence against any defamation action for anything you might say at the meeting. However, you are expected not to abuse this privilege, and it is my duty as chair to ensure that this privilege is not abused. Therefore, if your statements are potentially defamatory in relation to identifying a person or entity, you will be directed to discontinue your remarks. It is imperative that you comply with such direction. I have no doubt that will not happen. Happen. However, it is important just to point that out. So, Adrian, if I could begin with you and maybe invite you to make your opening statement and just to remind you not longer than three minutes, if you can. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and, and thank you for the invitation to attend today. I'm pleased to meet with the committee and to discuss the critical issues facing um, public media in Ireland. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on the sector generally, not least on public media. At the start of this pandemic, our focus was simply on staying on air, or remaining in print. But we've gone far beyond this initial ambition to deliver for the people of Ireland day in, day out. Despite the logistical, financial and human challenges of the early stages of the pandemic, Ireland's media, both local and national, has played a critical and leading role in keeping people informed, engaged and safe. Naturally, I want to highlight the very particular contribution RTE made during this time. Along with uh, public service media all across Europe, RT has informed and empowered the public in Ireland. In the most recent Behaviours and Attitudes research, 90% uh, of audiences indicated that they turned to RTE for COVID-19 coverage, while a further 76% said they would trust RT above all else. This is a confidence and a trust that has been earned over many years, and in many ways. Whether it be in moments of celebration or in times of crisis, it is RT's privilege and RT's unique responsibility to be the place where people turn and the place that brings the nation together. Once again, RT showed and demonstrated its clear public purpose during this crisis. As an essential service bringing the nation together, RT maintained full schedules across all services, augmenting where appropriate with additional live broadcasts and brand new programmes. Certain production had to be suspended or stepped down due to public health restrictions. But new and exciting programming, such as Homeschool Hub, Ireland on Call, Inside St James's, were commissioned in their place, often within exceptionally tight deadlines. This level of resilience and this level of output under such challenging circumstances wasn't easy. But thanks to the flexibility of staff, 
uh, of our staff, their commitment, as well as our partners in the independent radio and television sector, the service to the people of Ireland was not only upheld, but excelled. Alongside comprehensive and in-depth news and current affairs coverage, RT has been a source of companionship, diversion and connection for millions. People have, learned, have leaned upon our new daily religious services and on a wealth of pop-up cultural events supported by RTE. People have turned to Irish stories in all their forms, from documentaries to drama and comedy to investigative journalism. The nation has joined together in helping us bring light to darker days with events such as Shine a Light or RTE Does Comic Relief. New Irish drama like the hugely acclaimed Normal People got the nation talking and connecting us more than ever. And with connection comes community. We've rallied around Irish business, Irish artists, producers, frontline workers, and the vulnerable. RT and the people of Ireland have raised over 12 million this year for charity. And for family and friends who could not travel back to Ireland, RT has played a unique and important role. These achievements came against a backdrop of extreme financial uncertainty. RT is funded through a, comb a combination of public funding and commercial income. An immediate result of COVID-19 was a sharp drop in licence fee income and a decline in advertising revenues. Commercial income in quarter four has stabilised to some degree, as has income from the TV licence. But the outlook for 2021 is more uncertain. Certain types of expenditure, such as commitments to major sporting events, have only been deferred. And this adds to the financial pressures of the year ahead. The toll of Brexit in the national economy and commercial performance in 2021 is unknowable. The combination of a broken TV licence system and a precarious commercial environment exposes undeniable vulnerabilities for the national public service media. The newly formed Media Commission began its formal programme of work last week with the intention that they uh, complete their deliberations and formal assessment within the next nine months. We welcome the commitment to the programme in the programme for government to chart a pathway for public service broadcasting and independent media into the future. This pathway is much needed. COVID-19 has underscored the importance of public service media to the functioning of a country, of a democracy, to the nurturing of cultural vitality, unity and community. We would urge all members of the committee to engage with the work of the Commission and to consider its recommendations with urgency, clarity and shared purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. We'll not, um, we'll, we'll not hold you to account for going over the time, but it was a very uh, Thanks, insightful Joe. presentation. And just for our guests, I know you may not be aware, but we have a clock there, so if you can just uh, stick to that as rigidly as possible, we very much appreciate it. So, uh, next I might ask Seamus if you would like to make your presentation <clears throat> to the committee. You have the floor. Uh, clearly, thank you for recognising the importance of consultation with the NUJ at an early stage in developing your programme of work. On March the 20th last, we called for a forum on the crisis then facing the media industry across all sectors and platforms. While initiatives were taken in respect of tourism, hospitality and the arts, no immediate substantial measures were taken to assist the media, apart from the welcome initiative in respect of independent commercial radio. While employment in the print, broadcasting and digital sector is not comparable to tourism, the implications for democracy of a diminished media sector should be of concern to this committee. Listening to the contribution of the Minister last week, I regret to say that there was precious little clarity on how it is proposed, for instance, to address the financial situation in RTE. We are gravely concerned for the future of public service broadcasting in Ireland. There was no real recognition of the tsunami which is engulfing the newspaper sector, in particular the regional press. The focus on independent production within broadcasting ignores the existence of freelance workers, writers, photographers and videographers in other sectors. We welcome the fact that the Future of Media Commission has commenced its work, but if we don't see immediate action, there will be no future for many media workers in Ireland. And this is a point I know that will be echoed by John Parson. It is worth noting that on the 26th of September 2014, the NUJ called for the establishment of a government commission on the future of the media in a submission to a BAI seminar ensuring plurality in the digital age. This is not a new idea. The Union's recovery plan forms the basis of our approach to the current crisis, and I have circulated to the Committee for ease of reference a copy with this statement. 
Among the short-term measures, we have proposed our windfall tax of 6% on the tech joints using the UK digital services tax model towards funding a news recovery plan. Assistance for freelance workers who have sustained income losses but are outside the scope of wage subsidy schemes. No public money to firms making compulsory redundancies, cutting pay, giving executive bonuses or blocking trade union organisation. Companies receiving public funds to be pro prohibited for five years from engaging in mergers and acquisition activities or leveraged buyout, buyouts that result in job losses or pay reductions. Strategic investment in government advertising, the establishment of an innovative fund to promote public service journalism at local and national level, developing the model used in the Simon Cumbers Media Fund established by Ireland Aid, free vouchers for online or print subscriptions for all 18 and 19 year olds, and tax credits for households with subscriptions for over 70 year olds in line with the free licensing scheme. I will answer any questions to the committee may have on the impact of the pandemic on the media, but I thought it useful at this stage to set out a strategic approach to the crisis and to appeal for a more imaginative uh, approach to that crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seamus. And just to let you know, we'll do all of our witnesses first and then we'll go to the members and allow them for questions in the presentations, if that's OK. So, John, it's over to you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Smith. Thank you for the invitation to attend this meeting today for a discussion on the future of public service broadcasting. Radio listenership across our stations, and indeed RTE in Ireland, is a unique media success story. Each day, a mass of 3.9 million people listen to local, regional, city and national stations. 68.6 per cent of prime time radio listening by these people is spent listening to member stations of IBI. During COVID, but prior to and no matter what happens after COVID, our stations hope to provide a hugely important public broadcasting service, news, sport, discussion and a forum for debate, information and programme content that is relevant to the people who listen to us and reflects their lives. Ours is a sector that has suffered huge disruption and decreases in revenue, threatening our services long before COVID. So we welcome the establishment of the Commission on the Future of Media. We look forward to working with Professor McRae and his colleagues. However, we believe that the entire process after the Commission produces its report, from hearings to implementation of legislation, will by its nature be very protracted. It is obvious that changes as a result of the deliberations will not be implemented until at least the second half of 2022 or perhaps into 2023. We simply cannot wait that long. We are preoccupied with surviving the current crisis. We and the entire media sector need action now to enable the survival of our services and the services of other media through the protracted COVID crisis, which has intensified the already severe threats we face. Our sector is very grateful for the special measures brought in for us, which helped us weather the initial COVID trauma. This consisted of a fund of 2.5 million euros distributed to stations who committed to specific public service programmes up to a period which lasted to the end of the summer. The broadcasting levy was also suspended for the first six months of this year. Government investment in advertising on our stations was also hugely welcome. We all thought, somewhat optimistically I think with hindsight, that a close, close to the normal situation would have returned by the commercially crucial fourth quarter of the year. Instead, we are spending November, the most commercially important month for all stations, in level five lockdown, and the support measures have lapsed months ago. The broadcasting levy has been reintroduced since last July, and the money allocated for COVID programming is now spent. The €2 million Euros in the July stimulus package for Sound and Vision, which was mentioned by the Minister at this committee last week, does not apply to our stations. We urgently need another fund to put support public service output now. We also urgently need to have the broadcasting levy waived again until such time as the necessary legislation to abolish it, as we have been promised as far back as 2016, can be implemented. In conclusion, we are delighted to have the opportunity to meet Catherine Martin this coming Monday, and we look forward to that. We welcome her acknowledgement at this committee of the importance of the services we provide. 
We were heartened by her pledge to work with us to ensure that we survive this current crisis and continue our important work. But I cannot emphasise this enough. The current situation for media operators, be they radio, television or newspapers, is very urgent. Time is of the essence and action speaks louder than words. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Very stark um, presentations by all three of you here today, and I don't think there's anybody uh, around this chamber would disagree with anything that you have to say. So we'll get straight to questions with our, our members. Can I um, invite uh, Senator Warfield to make his um, presentation or questions? Thanks, Claire Hulock. Um, and with respect to uh, all of the speakers here, um, my six minutes may be taken up with questions for uh, Adrian. Um, I, I want to ask firstly just about RTE's um, plans around streaming and the RTE player. I see they're mentioned in some of the documents sent to the committee. Um, I use the RTE player on Apple TV. I'm uh, familiar with its intricacies, particularly in terms of live TV. Um, my question is how RTE can better compete with the streaming platforms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, um, Disney Plus, and the, a whole array of niche OTT services that exist in the market now. And I'm also aware of the importance of findability in this conversation. Um, um, and would you have any, do RTE have any recommendations in terms of um, improving findability for, for the public service broadcasters, TG Car and RTE, on the Apple TV, on the Samsung TVs, or, or wherever? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um, to answer both of those questions, uh, I think firstly to say it's interesting, like you mentioned, the streamers. So we do a lot of on my uh, job as director of audiences. Um, so... Oh, can I? Great. Um, I... Um, I'm director of audiences at, at RTE, so we do a lot of research all the time into streamers, and we can just see the level of streaming currently going on from Disney+, Plus, Netflix, and so on. So you have these global companies that are, in Netflix's case, they have 7,000 people working in the company, I think 6,500 of them just working on the streaming technology. Um, and I think that in order for us to compete, firstly, you know, we need to be the key destination for original Irish content. But secondly, it's also about getting the technology right. So we've done a lot of work this year in terms of actually improving the user experience. And in terms of the player, the growth we've seen this year, it's about 74% in terms of streams that are consumed. So I think it comes back to, in a way, a part of the, um, in all three presentations, the kind of financial challenges, because investment in technology, particularly when you're, uh, you know, in a country the size of Ireland, in terms of our scalability and everything like that, it's different if you're Netflix, you need a significant capital spend. So if you have structural issues around financing, that can uh, impede your ability to actually develop products that people will just expect as, as kind of, as basic hygiene, you know? Um, in terms of prominence, um, we are in the process of working on a paper with TG Cahar around prominence. Prominence is key in discoverability. We all know, and those of us who have children or teenagers, um, they're consuming video in a totally different way. Um, there's lots of different gateways. So you have pay TV, be it Sky, be it Virgin, and so on. So it is really important for public service broadcasting that it has anchor positions, be it our, uh, within the EPG, are indeed as we move towards IP in the future in terms of the an app, because what you don't want is uh, other companies disaggregating your content. You want to be uh, findable. Otherwise, I would also say, lastly, if you look at our, let's say, our news and current affairs consumption uh, during the pandemic, like the nine o'clock news regularly does 900,000, but massive consumption on the player as well. So we can see for 15 to 34s, significant consumption and engagement with public media, which we think is really important. Um, I'm just conscious of time. So, um, you know, you mentioned the, the growth of viewers online. How long do you anticipate RT will be actually scheduling TV? So, you know, traditional transmission of, of TV. How long do you anticipate that will continue? And are you prepared for the, the revenue fall off? The RT player must not make a whole lot of money. Um, TG Carr launched uh, a really good player on the Apple TV app recently. I downloaded it this week. Um, th there are no ads there either. So uh, there's a natural fall off in the revenue. 
how long do you anticipate you'll be scheduled on TV? Um, and yeah, I'm conscious it's a very disruptive yeah, space. Absolutely. Really. I think in terms of all these changes that we'll still be scheduling TV in like eight years or ten years, there'll still be EPGs, there'll still be linear consumption of television. What you will see is more and more growth through single destination points, such as the player. Uh, what that throws up for us obviously is a challenge uh, from a commercial point of view, as you point out, because what you're trying to do then is uh, you're trying to uh, offset your uh, any declines in linear in terms of what you can uh, gain from your player commercial. Now, that said, uh, in this market, premium Irish VOD uh, has a very uh, high value on it. Uh, so I think that uh, also because specifically it brings in a lot of 15 to 34-year-olds. So if you were, and we're a public service broadcaster, so we look at all our decisions through that lens. But if you were looking at it just from a, a funding commercial lens, what you'd see actually is that you know, apps and so on offer significant opportunities uh, to to secure commercial revenue. Thank you very I, much. I know what I'm Go on. Um, but I think, you know, I think we, it would all be, we would all do well possibly to consider the mixed funding model in the yeah. context of the dramatically falling revenue. You know, you, you're losing editorial control with commercial, with the need for commercial revenue. Um, I think that the, the, the two funding model, I think we're going to need to probably have a, a bigger conversation about that in the future. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good contribution and great conversation to have. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, and just to remind members, we only have five minutes. We have to reduce a little bit to ensure every member gets in. Senator Castle, it's over to you. Okay. Thanks, uh, Chairman. Welcome to all three um, witnesses. And just to thank the members in the journalistic fraternity that all three witnesses represent, especially when you consider, as Adrian has pointed out, there's still a hunger there and a, new, and a, and a you know, from the public for proper news content, as opposed to the guff that is put on social media without any fact checking, without any recourse to libel laws, and that the people in this room uh, represent NUJ members uh, that actually care about proper news content. And in that context, I was glad to see uh, online subscriptions to our major papers as well increase during COVID. People still want good news. Uh, I'm going to split my time half and half. So just firstly, Adrian, in your respect, uh, this time last year, D Forbes outlined uh, the major financial challenges facing RTE. And can I, on that, can I just quickly address how that uh, plan is progressing in terms of the 60 million cost cutting, the 200 jobs that were anticipated to be gone this year, and the sale of the land, and also in terms of actually rebalancing it on the other side, because there's no point cutting it down to the bone completely and then not having a state broadcaster that can actually compete against and um, people bemoaning then why we're not as, as good, whereas RT Radio has shown it is a world leader and has been recognised as such. But on that, where are we in terms of RT's uh, liaison with the government on the broadcasting charge? Uh, and uh, also in terms of the income uh, that RT is bringing in on the online platforms. You've outlined how much is coming in, and, or the increase in the streaming, but how much is coming in on the online uh, charges. If you could just maybe address that in a minute or so, so I can move to the NUJ. On the all. Uh, first thing just to say is that we will uh, deliver on the plan that we proposed one year ago when the Director General came here. Um, so that is being delivered. Uh, we will achieve those cost savings in 2020. Yeah. In 2020. So will all 200 jobs be actually called in 2020? This is, I'm just saying in terms of, because uh, just splitting out uh, the question, so there is the actual financial number, and we are going to achieve that this year, and that is really through very good cost management. It's also through changes within the schedule uh, that we've had. Also, we've had some deferral of, let's say, big sporting events into 2021. So that number is going to be delivered, and we're, we will deliver uh, our target number over the, the coming years out to 2023. In terms of the 200 redundancies, uh, as you know, and as the Minister um, has been speaking about, um, you have a number of those coming from the uh, NSO, uh, the National Symphony Orchestra, I think it's 73, who are moving over... Um, so they're leaving RTE, and, uh, but also on top of that, we've now opened a, a, uh, and are opening in January a, a voluntary exit package, and we're looking for 
uh, 70, 60 to 70 uh, exits at that point. And why are we looking for a slightly reduced number? Part of it is because we have been delivering such significant output and we've changed the way we are working significantly. There's so much remote working we need to. We really see that we need to keep these essential services on air. So we need to make sure that we're, we're able to bolster that okay. and deliver it to the I'm Irish I'm going to jump public. in because I want to ask uh, Seamus and John a question that's actually linked to RT then as well. Um, just on the protection, in particular, of regional media, be it, be it print or radio, uh, newsrooms have been cut drastically since I worked in one over 20 years ago. Uh, and the impact on what that has on local court service, um, on local sports, on, on, on local council meetings. One idea, and I discussed it with uh, the former uh, UK Media Secretary John Whittingdale when I met him two years ago at a particular conference, was the introduction of a, a, a local democracy reporting service that uses a portion of the state licence fee to fund local journalists, which is then syndicated. I think there's some 150 local democracy reporters. Is it something that the NUJ, IBL could work with in terms of RTE uh, to achieve local democracy reporting on the ground? I think the local democracy scheme is an interesting scheme and it has potential, provided it's not used as a means of displacing jobs or journalism. I wouldn't want to see it in areas such as Tipperary, where we have had a newcomer into the market uh, pulling titles apart. But I actually think there are huge swathes of this country, uh, not just rural. People think of <coughs> local papers as being rural. They're, they're also in urban areas where there is a need for diversity, there's need for coverage, and any form of imaginative scheme uh, which would help a and fund that sector uh, is a good idea. I mean, that's why we talked about an innovation fund, and it could also assist not just staff, but also freelancers as well. We need, we, there has been a tradition here of being sceptical of state intervention or funding of media, but actually it works quite well in the Sound and Vision scheme. There is no reason why properly uh, structured that could not be used. John? I think uh, the fund that the BAI introduced at the start of the COVID provides a model whereby stations had to apply for funding out outlined the programming that they would uh, provide during COVID and receive money to do that. The alternative to receiving that money and applying it to those programmes was that jobs would have been lost and the, the type of devastation to newsrooms and talk programmes that you talked about would have happened during COVID. And Adrian, you wouldn't be opposed to such a, a scheme being introduced in Ireland, no? Because I think if you know, we've always said that you know we're not looking to hire the licence fee. Uh, we're just looking to have it uh, reformed and fixed. And what is the evasion rate at the moment? It's around forty million euro per annum, isn't it's it? It's about fifty million. Fifty and million. Yeah. When you add it up, you've got about one hundred and forty thousand no TV homes, and then you've got about two hundred and fifty thousand people who do, don't pay the licence. You put all that together, you have fifty million, and we'll be having a very different conversation in this room. And uh, you know, as as the kind of you know. Uh, lead in terms of public service media. We, of course, want to support local journalism, local radio. That's absolutely essential uh, to the democracy in this country. And also, I think it was fair to say that, you know, having just been looked at and witnessed the American election, you know, strong public service media is like a giant sinkhole <coughs> for polarization. It actually brings things together. So uh, it's, it's absolutely vital. So we'd be very supportive. Thank you, Thank you very much, <coughs> Senator Cassis, and to our. Uh, Guests, um, Senator Michael Carey, he's not here. Um, Deputy Matty McGrath. Thank you, Apologies for being a bit late. I too just want to look, I haven't time to deal with the guests and notice to speak to any of them, just to thank RT. Any time I go out there, we always get well received and looked after, and I appreciate that. I have issues, I suppose, with the licence, but won't go into them today. I really want to cut to our guests, you mentioned Tipperary and the local media, and, and the savaging and real, you know, the gobbling up. Of, of titles that are there with, you know, some of them are there since last century. And it's been, and the, the treatment of journalists, long-standing, excellent journalists who gave huge service, quality service, and respected in the area, and they were just literally uh, thrown to the wolves. And then we, we have seen these companies, you know, um, you know getting pub payments and getting uh, the, the other subsidy schemes from, from COVID. While they're still running the titles as skeleton staff, these titles have give valuable service to the communities, and the communities have a linkage with them. You have them in your own county as well, um, uh, Chair. And we all have them. And they were a household item. You wouldn't have the weekly news if you didn't have them. But I want to just pay tribute here to the wonderful journalists who have been just cast aside 
and trampled upon. And we have an awful situation in Tipperary. It's, it's outrageous and it's just went on and no, no, there's no um, accountability or no justice for these long-serving titles and the staff and the families and the community they served. And I think it's, it's shocking. I also want to, um, again, to thank the local radios uh, and local media, but the radios really for the, the linkage and the maintain the linkage into the family homes from morning to night, from the cradle to the grave, really, from birth notices to um, death notices. So, and they have come into their own and uh, in this uh, time. But I have issues as regards the the, the the dissemination of the funds, you know, and the, not enough funds going to independent radio and to the local titles. So, I'd like to get some answers to those, please. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think when we're talking about media, uh, the, the situation that you explain, and I, I should declare a, an interest, I started in the Midlands Tribune in Borough, that paper has been taken over by the same company that took over the title, two titles in Tipperary, papers in Limerick, Kildare, uh, and Offaly. That is a, a consequence of the political failure to deal with concentration of ownership. That is a reality. And the other political failure is the failure to grant the right to trade union recognition and collective representation, because the company that has taken over those titles and which has merged a number of titles through merger by default, through common pages and all the rest of it, that's a con that, that has happened because there's been no uh, right to trade union representation. And there, has, and it is, there are consequences for media diversity in the consequence of you need plurality, you need a number of titles in the same region in order to assure that courts and news are covered, you need that kind of vibrant differences of opinion, different of focus. And regional papers in this country are in a particularly precarious position. And recently the government announced its gov a government resilience campaign, which is a, a nationwide campaign. And what's significant in the, the, the criteria for that, nat that national media advertising campaign is there's one sector missing from it and that is newspapers. And if we want to talk about government support, then you have to recognise that the national, the regional newspapers need it. But they're not looking for handouts. They need it because, like the local radio stations, they remain relevant. And the people who read the Mead Chronicle or the Tullamore Tribune are the people who are in rural areas who rely on the print media and the local radio. They're not, they're not one or other. They're both hugely important. Just thank you, Deputy McGrath, for your, um, your uh, kind words. Just in relation to the funding um, you talked about, the levy was waived for the first six months on, on local stations. The cost of that was €1 million. Euros. Um, the uh, the um, Sound and Vision Fund cost €2.5 million, which lasted about six uh, months, and the wage subsidy scheme was in operation as well. Just to put those funds into perspective, uh, a, a typical local radio station that would be seeing a 20% drop in its revenue at the moment uh, would be seeing a decrease in revenue of between 350 and 500,000 on a per annum basis. Without the wage subsidy scheme, with the levy continuing and without the continuation of a, a, a type of sound and vision fund, it will not be possible to continue to provide the kinds of services which you talk so well about. And so that's why we cannot wait until the media commission, which will report next year uh, and so on. Just in a few seconds, I've left here, if you allow me. So you need immediate, and we discussed this even in immediate support. We discussed this here last week also. So I, and I can see the, the back, the lacuna, and we, I know it from a business perspective. So it's serious times, and, and we need to uh, pony up. And you're right as well about uh, lack of political leadership. It's a shame. This happened in the meat industry, and it happened in, in the supermarkets, and we're left with massive conglomerates, and we have no local connectivity. And it's a sad loss to the heritage and, and, and the life and the very living of our, of, of our, our countryside, really. Thank, thank you. Very much, uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Annie Hoey. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, I just want to commend the media, broadcasting and journalism sector for getting us through the COVID-19 crisis. I think it's quite clear that many people in Ireland relied on public service broadcasting and indeed journalists to provide information over the past few months, um, and particularly the likes of RTE and the education programming when schools were out. That was really great. Um, I think also, I mean, Senator Warfield kind of touched on this around the online um, platforms and stuff, so I, possibly we don't really need to go into it again, but I know she said two and a half million people watch normal people on the RT player, and I'd say we got a similar amount of people complaining that they couldn't get the RT player to work, uh, perhaps not two and a half million, but it is, I think, a really, it is a really serious problem in terms of if the reputation is preceding you in terms of the player not working, you're not going to be able to drive the traffic to it, so it is just something I think to, to recognise because there's really great content on it 
and you know, trying to get people onto it if all they hear about is how impossible it is is, is obviously a, a problem for yourselves. Um, I might just take a moment to talk about the rights of freelance workers and it's great to have someone from the, uh, the National Union of Journalists here. Um, maybe someone could offer commentary on the need for state support or for freelance journalists. Um, you know, we have the Sound of Vision Fund that's administered by the BAI, but that's confined to broadcast journalism. So there's a whole series of journalists who are, who are being left out of that. So I wonder, could someone offer commentary on that? And also from a Labour Party perspective and a workers' rights perspective, I am concerned about workers' rights in the sector. Um, I'd be very firm in my belief that if the state is to give special assistance, there should be corresponding assurances, you know, in relation to employment rights, wages, payment, um, and particularly recognising the rights of workers to be represented by trade unions. And, you know, the commercial radio sector is generally low paid. Union recognition has been sometimes fraught. Um, I know there are some, some stations that do recognise union recognition, but it is a, a somewhat of a problem across the sector. And I have heard that today that there have been pay cuts in a number of radio stations. You know, so if, so if you're... If you're seeking um, state aid and state supports, you know, how are we going to balance that with, with the rights of the workers who are the, the ones who will be, if they're the ones having pay cuts or, or are losing out? So I know I've only left a very tiny amount of time to answer that. Yeah. Um, of course, why, you know, there, I agree with you that many of those cuts have been imposed and have been impo imposed without negotiation. I think that's inappropriate. I think that there are norms which the state expects, and if the state is uh, assisting any sector, I say that as a member of the executive of the ICTU, then I think that there has to be a correlation respect for the norms. In relation to freelancers, I think that we do need to recognise that a significant number of journalists in this country are freelance and that there should be some kind of innovation fund. I think the Simon Cumbers Fund that I mentioned is an interesting example of the kind of supports that could exist and there is no reason at all why would they should not, that there should not be a state innovation fund for that. I, one of the issues that has frequently arisen has been the issue of bogus self-employment. We addressed that in RTE largely. Now it's, it's still on way in relation to Evershets. I'm very glad we did because there was a way the workers who were then protected and were enabled to apply for the state support schemes. Many other freelancers were excluded for that and the only way that they could look for aid was to go for a, a job seeker's allowance and then if they qualified the job seeker's allowance they couldn't work at all and that doesn't make sense. So we do need a, a, an approach to that and echoing what John has said, we don't need that in two years time. People are leaving the profession and we're losing really good were a good journalist because they cannot afford to be journalists. Just to follow up on your point on the Sound of Vision scheme, it's noteworthy that news, current affairs and regular programming uh, that would be provided by many uh, freelancers and so on is specifically excluded from the Sound and Vision scheme. So the Sound and Vision scheme is largely used for dramas, documentaries and, and it's also noteworthy that the vast majority of it goes towards TV, uh, which doesn't cover our uh, our, our people. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, you finished? Yes, fine. Thank you very much, Senator Holly. Um, Deputy Melda Munster. Okay, um, first question would be to um, Seamus there from the NUG. You mentioned the terms of, rich, of um, reference for the Commission were way too, too narrow. What, just very briefly, what would you like to see included? First of all, I would be very slow to extend them now because of the time frame needed, but I would have liked to see the Commission doing in a number of phases. There are areas such as access to the industry, areas such as addressing the, gen the gender imbalance within the industry, uh, issues around training. These are areas which need to be addressed and need to be addressed very quickly. Access to the profession, making it more uh, diverse, and I think that if the Committee is looking for work, they should look at the terms of reference of the Commission and look at some of the areas like these which are not going to be addressed in the time frame by the Commission because it is important that we have a funded and representative and diverse media and they are some of the areas that I would like to see addressed. We can examine that as a committee. Um, just looking through your proposals, you outline what I would um, determine as very interesting proposals. Have you uh, met with the Minister to discuss these or do you intend 
we're, to meet. Yeah, we're meeting the minister next week. Uh, uh, unusually, uh, our the plan was launched both the UK and Ireland, and the UK government have been much more active than the Irish government, and in fact established a weekly call with the Secretary of State for Culture and the Arts uh, during the pandemic. So we're behind the curve on this, but we are meeting the minister next week, and I think one of the keystone key cornerstones of what we are suggesting is the windfall ta tax on tech giants, because frankly they have been free passengers on the bus and all of us uh, are united in terms of providing the, 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 group, the big tech giants with a service okay. that they exploit without giving anything to the media in return, to those who generate it. Okay. And a and lot maybe, of proposals we're talking about would fund those. Yes, um, thank you. And maybe you might revert to us with um, the outcome of that meeting if there was any... Absolutely, and we will be quite happy at a later stage to, to do a more comprehensive that, yeah. presentation. Okay. Just to Mr Parcel now, um, you had mentioned that the future of uh, the Media Commission was way too lengthy for you to benefit in, in the here and now when you need it. Um, would you well, have you any other suggestions? Would you su suggest maybe a, a, media, a COVID media task force to address the Well, the I think, yeah, something like that is, is, would be appropriate because just um, the, the time frame, as I understand it, it was initially meant to report this year, but obviously due to it's COVID that was back, postponed. Yeah. It's into next year. Mm -hmm. But the job is only half done after. You, mm -hmm. you guys need to then debate the issues. Legislation needs mm -hmm. to be drafted, discussed, and go through the process. So you're talking two or three years down yeah. the line. Um, and we've then. had experience in the past of reports being done. They point way forward, and then an election comes, mm -hmm. for example. So we think something interim, like... Uh, an emergency task force to look at practical situ mm. solutions that can be put in place to support radio, to support RTE, to support mm. newspapers, mm -hmm. um, until such time as the broader picture can be scoped yeah. out. I presume you'll be mentioned, uh, is it yourselves that have the meeting with the Minister on Monday? Yeah. yeah. You'll be mentioned something like that. We will indeed, yeah, the, but we need, it the, we need, it, it, I would suggest that it, it is an issue for broad government uh, and all parties in mm -hmm. here because yeah, the survival of the Indigenous Irish media concerns same, everybody. Say the same to yourself, as I said to Mr Dooley, if you come back to us with Delighted, that, thank uh, you yeah, very much. Just to uh, yeah. follow up on it. You also made reference to the broadcasting levy and the um, special funding. Now, I had difficulty trying to get clarity on the 2.5... Um, million last year, and you've said that it was provided to radio stations earlier in the year. But is, is that it? There's been nothing since. There was um, 2.5 million was provided under a scheme called the Sound and Vision 4 uh, scheme, which provided for COVID-related programming, and that mm. the application process took place in March and April, and the funding supported programming in, in our station, for example, up until the end of July. Mm -hmm. the, mi the Minister last week mentioned uh, a sum of two million, which was announced as part of the stimulus package um, for Sound and Vision. But that Sound and Vision round specifically uh, excludes the stations like ourselves from applying for it. And there was right. detail in that to, in a response uh, to deputy, uh, um, a parliamentary question mm. which Minister Martin answered, which I can supply to you Please, in due course. You I don't yeah, yeah. And you're also looking for the um, the levy, the levy yeah. the, that was reintroduced in in July. The levy was reintroduced in July and, and it's payable by us burden. now. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and it, in actual fact the levy has been increased by a small amount due to a technicality, so the levy is Just still there. And, and we, also, we, we also think that some recognition of the service that we provide, and it's around the 20 to 20 or to 30 per cent, many of our members fall foul or fall below the 30 per cent okay. reduction, so we believe right. some leeway okay. should be given. Okay, thank you for that. Just very quickly, just to RT, just, um, uh, can you just outline it, uh, um, just what additional funding you received in the budget for, uh, for this for this, this year's budget, but also um, how much of a fan funding gap there is now that you'll need. Yeah, so um, we availed of the TWSS, um, so mm. in uh, March, April, May, right through to really the end of August, uh, both our commercial revenue and licence fee 
um, really significantly went down. I mean, plus 30% was the drop. So um, we had a significant problem, which was on top of we'd already come into the year in a financially exacerbated situation. So it was significant. Um, so by managing costs and with the return of commercial income because of our audience performance and the fact that uh, society opened up again so people could pay the licence fee, um, that has kind of stabilised. Um, when you look forward into the, the coming years, obviously things are pretty dynamic. Uh, we know there's a gap there. Um, in terms of putting an exact number on it, uh, I won't be able to do that today, but we know there's, I mean, the factors in the mix are commercial performance. We don't know what that is going to look like in 21 in terms of the impact of unemployment, uh, impact of COVID in the economy and so on. Um, license fee, will that uh, renormalize? Again, we don't know that. So it's dynamic. Plus, we have next year uh, the Olympics. Um, so the Olympics, if it goes ahead in August, September, is a significant cost. And uh, we also have the Euros. So they are things that were supposed to have taken place this year. So yeah, just, do you have a figure for the additional funding that you were given in Budget 2021? Oh, in terms of uh, Budget 19, the 10 million euros? Yes. Oh, yeah, it was 10 million. Ten, just 10 yeah. million, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. And just finally, just one very brief question, Chair. Um, the time frame that was outlined in the future of uh, Media Commission um, regarding the licence fee, do you suspect that that will be dealt with midway through the process? You know, will that be reported back on, or will it be all the reporting at the end of the the process, which could be 2022. I'm actually not further, sure, because not sure. When, it, when the initial terms of uh, reference were quite focused on that, and then it was broadened out, so I, I'm not quite sure okay. how they structured it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Christopher O'Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to say at the outset, I'm, I'm delighted uh, that you're here to address the committee. Um, and just starting with, with John, um, you know, I don't have any questions. I just want to kind of lend my support and reiterate the importance of um, local radio stations uh, in Cork. We're really lucky to have C103 and 96FM and uh, Red FM. And, you know, if you take a show like uh, Cork Today, uh, which is broadcast in C103, the, the service uh, and the information that they provide, this pandemic has really demonstrated that um, more than anything else. But prior to that, you had the likes of Ophelia, where, you know, we were all pretty much... Uh, locked in behind closed doors at that point as well, or the beast from the east. The support, uh, the information that they were giving to the public in the region, and um, just the comfort as well that they were there um, was is huge. So, you know, I'd, I'd echo your, your cause. Uh, you've, you've made a couple of simple requests there, the reintroduction of the waiver of the levy, um, you know, and the expansion of the Sound and Vision Scheme, um, something that look, I'd, I'd certainly be supporting and urging the Minister to, to, to listen to you on that. But... Um, and just in relation to the regional newspapers, which I presume um, I might address this to Seamus since he mentions it in uh, his address, um, again, really important service that they provide. Um, and there's some, in regions like West Cork, there's some local newspapers that are read by some people from back to front and front to back again. And they depend on um, that distribu distribution of that in the local shop. Uh, and that option isn't there, obviously, under lockdown. So you imagine the revenue for these papers is falling, the advertising revenue is falling because... Um, businesses are struggling or they're on supports. Um, but one challenge that I'm, I'm sure they're facing is because their um, natural, uh, I suppose, distribution of the paper would be in the shop where you know people would go in and pick it up and buy it. Um, obviously, they're trying to move to online, but it's very, very difficult for these regional papers to compete with the other online offerings that are there. So I'm wondering, is there any ideas or creative ways that that, that can be um, addressed? Um, and just, I'll just follow up on my question to um, Adrian as well. Uh, disappointed that Dee isn't here. Dee is a fellow West Cork person. Uh, she's from uh, Drum League, where my, my father is from, actually. Um, and I hope she, she gets better soon. But uh, just again to, to commend RT for, for the service that they've provided uh, over the, the, the past um, few months, or in general, of course, but certainly during the pandemic, uh, the figures, I assume, are, are through the roof in terms of bulletins in relation to public health updates. Um, and I would generally, I, I, I'd compare um, a public service broadcaster like RT to, you know, public transport. We need to invest in it. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be about profit making and and, uh, and and huge revenue. Obviously, you have to maintain revenue, but it's something that we need to protect uh, as a state. Obviously, keeping that balance of independence as well. 
Um, but the question I'd have is, you mentioned in your statement that the licence fee uh, process is broken. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on what alternatives there might be there. Um, the BBC are talking about changing their model, um, going to some uh, something closer to the Swedish model. Uh, they're obviously having big issues uh, competing with the uh, huge streaming services, the likes of Netflix. Um, they're trying to find ways around it. My understanding is that even they're having difficulty uh, and they're a huge corporation. Um, so what do we do to combat that? I mean, people have meant, I think most speakers have mentioned normal people at this stage and the success of it. Is that what we need to do? Do we need to invest in, like we have creativity, we have skill, we have talent. Do we need to invest in our own productions that we can export and earn income from? Um, you know, the likes of natural history. We can do just as good as the BBC on that. Uh, should we do more of that? So there's about a minute left. So the first one is just in relation to the regional papers possibly going in line in the second one then for each. I'm presuming at some stage you will hear from the newspaper owners, and I dare not to speak from them, but I do think their campaign for reduction in, in VAT uh, is, uh, and in fact, a zero rate of VAT is worth considering. Uh, I have mentioned that the government currently has a Keep Well in Your Community campaign, which is excluding in the advertising, the placing of ads, excludes print media. That's inexplicable. So there's no point in talking about how wonderful they are if you don't actually resource them. Uh, and on your final point, because I obviously also represent broadcasters, I would advise at once uh, the Committee Against One Things, do not look to the Boris Johnson government as a, uh, in terms of its approach to BBC. They are embarking on a, on a strategy which will de destroy public broadcasting in, our, in Britain. Yeah. Um, so just uh, touching on two points. One, uh, just around IP. I mean, IP is the basis uh, of the entire broadcasting industry, certainly from a revenue point of view in terms of a return. Um, so that's absolutely essential. And that, in a way, coming back to the license fee, you know, if we manage to actually fix this, it means that we can invest uh, both in other broadcasters, but also in the independent sector, uh, who are kind of a key partner for us. Uh, we know we've got the talent here from a storytelling point of view uh, to actually tell our story to the world. And it's, it's trying to also recognise that when you do that, like something like normal people, there's a reason that there are thousands of people trying to get into Trinity College now and, you know, people will want to come and visit here, you know. It has a cultural impact. This is, you know, we, we need to kind of see it beyond the small numbers. You know, Ireland is a highly, you know, uh, we really value culture here and we have a fantastic culture. And that is a great story that we can tell the world. So that's absolutely key and I concur with your point. I think in terms of the collection part, that will be for the Commission. You can look across Europe, there's lots of examples. And when you were talking earlier, you're almost describing uh, public service media as a utility to democracy, you know, that it is. And that I know in some other countries they've, they've found a different way to bill it and so on at source. So, yeah. so we might Thank move you. on if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Kieran Cannon. Uh, thanks, uh, gentlemen, on this occasion, uh, for joining us and for outlining to us uh, the very significant challenges that you all face in continuing to uh, provide and develop the wonderful content that you produce. Um, Adrian, just a, quick, a couple of quick observations and maybe a question or two. Um, you quite rightly told, told us earlier on that uh, one of the key um, elements of public service broadcasting is to nurture our cultural vitality. And if any country can stand proud in terms of its cultural vitality and its cultural output, output uh, it is Ireland. Um, just interesting, from my, a former role of mine as, as Minister for Diaspora, um, if you look at example for the, the success of the Heaney piece, on Joe Biden piece on, on the news recently, I think it's up to 10.5 million views at this point, there is a ready, willing and perhaps vor voracious audience out there for, for the, the kind of content that Ireland is renowned for. Uh, and when you look at streaming services and on-demand TV, what kind of work is happening within RT right now, and maybe there isn't any, but should there be, uh, to somehow try better to connect with our 70 million uh, Irish worldwide? Um, it's a, a ready and willing audience, as I say, to, uh, to enjoy what we have to offer in terms of that cultural richness. Um, and I'm wondering, first of all, is there a way, I know there are issues around IP and so on, I think TG Cahar seems to have overcome them to a certain extent, um, but is there a way, first of all, of communicating better with our 70 million people worldwide, and secondly, leveraging that then to obviously to increase your, your income? Um, 
but I, I, I do agree with you. We have an extraordinary story to tell to the world. Uh, and we have that incredible Irish community around the world who are more than willing, not alone to be uh, recipients of that story, but to pass that story on to others as well. And I think that video from a couple of nights ago is just one example of that. Uh, Seamus, uh, thanks again for your, for your contribution also. Um, early on in the establishment of, of the Future of Media Commission, I did identify uh, a lacuna in the, the membership of the board in terms of its representation from journalists themselves, working journalists, journalists on the front line. And delighted to see that Siobhan Holliman has now been um, uh, appointed to the Commission. And I think her insights from working in both local radio and, and local journalism, uh, local print media, will be very valuable in determining how the future of Media Commission uh, explores the challenges faced by that particular sector and works collectively to address them in the future. Um, and then finally, John. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, if you look at the recent JNLR figures, um, the, the, the listenership for local radio uh, is, is growing exponentially. Um, what you have done um, through all of your stations, I'm just reflecting on my own experience with Goalie Bay FM, um, you have been incredibly uh, important in building powerful social solidarity all during the pandemic. You know, every, from the moment um, Gola Bay FM starts broadcasting at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. There is that sense of, of togetherness, of community, of looking out for those, perhaps and many of them, who live alone uh, within our communities across rural Galway in, in particular, uh, and knowing that they're being listened to, um, their fears are being addressed, and, and it happens day in, day out, almost, a, you know, it's, it's a normal part of the endeavours of, the, of that station, that's my own experience, but I'm sure that's replicated across the whole of local radio. So. We do need to, to ensure that that can continue, um, not alone to survive, but to thrive in the future and continue to have the opportunity to build, continue building that social solidarity. And also, I would argue, showcasing um, the wonderful richness of our local culture. Um, sometimes they don't have that opportunity to get that national exposure, and I think local radio has a crucial role to play there. So I wholeheartedly support your ongoing uh, calls for the uh, lifting of the broadcasting levy and for some additional supports to be given to you from a funding perspective so that, you know, when we get to the end of this, and we will get to the end of this, that you are as well positioned as you were at the beginning of this to continue providing that service to, to our local communities. And I wish you every success with the meeting with the Minister on Monday. Thank you. Thank you very much. And who would you like to address? Your... Yeah. 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 So just, yeah, the, so in terms of, let's say, our, 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 our digital products deputy, um, so if you take a week in October, October the 19th, that week uh, between RT.ie and RT News, uh, we had 77 million page loads, right, which is significant. 20% of that is coming from outside of Ireland. So this has been, it's been really a key portal in terms of connection uh, in a world where people can't travel. Uh, cannot access their own culture, connect with family and everything like that. At a very human level, it was allowing people who are abroad to connect in with what is happening in our country. Um, and to the question of culture then and exporting that, uh, in 2018 we streamed the Wexford Opera Festival on RT.ie. And through those learnings and then in when COVID arrived, we were able to apply that to uh, many kind of arts partnerships that we have. So right now we're doing we're doing Culture Night, we did Solar Bones with Rough Magic, we're doing the International Book Festival, we're doing the Dublin Theatre Festival, the Wexford uh, Opera Festival, we're doing uh, 12 Friday nights with the uh, National Symphony Orchestra. That's interesting, again, when you think about it, their audience on a Friday night typically would have been 600 people. That has now been watched by 3,000 people. We're also repeating it on linear in terms of RT1 on Sunday mornings. There's another 15,000 people coming in there. So I think that streaming plus our story offers a massive opportunity for the country, and it's a great way of connecting with our diaspora and, and, and kind of bringing Irish people together. Just to thank you, Deputy Cannon, for your um, remarks, but just also stations such as mine, KCLR, which covers Carlo Kilkenny during a similar period, uh, our online offerings would have garnered about 2 million page views just for Carlo Kilkenny with local content, but also people from overseas. overseas yeah. um, and I just wanted to say, after Deputy Sullivan made his kind remarks about our output and indeed yourself, that I think it's appropriate that I acknowledge the work of the staff um, in radio stations. I represent independent radio stations, but also RTE. 
uh, broadcasters over the period of the pandemic have confronted all sorts of obstacles in keeping the show on the road, and I think it's only right that when I'm here today that I acknowledge that. So. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you. for your contribution. Uh, Deputy Peter, so Peter Fitzpatrick. Uh, 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 you can call me Minister if you like. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all, all here today. Uh, I have to say one thing is, over the, over the last months, I think the people of Ireland really, really appreciate the media. Like normally, as a, as a politician, you'd be afraid to open the papers in the morning time and listen to radio stations and that day, you'd be listening to all bad news. But I think, I think the citizens of Ireland over the last months, like the information they got on a daily basis from the, from the national telev television stations, from the national radio stations, from the national newspapers, and especially the local newspapers and especially the radio stations, like, you know, I come from County Loud and we have a radio station called LMFM and to be quite honest with you, especially the older people, you know, and I think, I think what they've done in the last number of months has done a fantastic job. Uh, I always say stay local. When I mean stay local, I mean stay, stay in Ireland. Uh, I would call myself a channel hopper. If I get the remote control, the, the wife and the kids would go absolutely mad because they just keep switching the stations. But in fairness, I've got to know the Irish stations over the last nine months, and I have to say, like, whether it's news, sports, dramas, documents, I think they've done a fantastic job and they really, really put their shoulder to the wheel. As a sports person, like, uh, I've seen the, the coverage that we get in the nationals and the locals and everything. I think it's done a, it's really, really done a great job there. And it's something that I took for granted, but I won't be taking it for granted going forward. I think this is, an, this, is a, this is an opportunity for everybody, and you know, especially for, uh, for publicising. So I know that the revenue and I know the local stations and that day and the local newspapers are struggling, but I think, you know, you know if, please God, we all put a shoulder to the wheel and we all say, look, we, 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 we've an opportunity uh, and some, some great programmes. Uh, I, I am a normal people fan myself. I think that the 12 episodes was absolutely fantastic. I think the way you put it out, two episodes per night, I thought was even, even better. But the only thing that really annoys me about that day, when I look at the credits at the end of it, and I'm looking at normal people, it's an Irish drama, this is great, and television. Next thing you see, produced by Elements Pictures uh, for the BBC Three. That really does annoy me, you know, because it's a, it's, it's a social with Ireland, and, and I'd love to see the whole thing with Ireland. And also the same with Mrs Brown's Boys. When you look at Mrs Brown's Boys, and you look at the end of it, network, you know, BBC One, that, that really does get to me. So what I want to know is why, why maybe our two most popular our programmes, getting all the credits from the, from the UK. And I'd like to, I'd like, I'd like to treat you as John, Aidan and Seamus. Give me an opportunity. Like, I'm giving you credit here because I'll be honest, I don't really give credit much, but I think what you've done for the last nine months, I think the Irish people own it, own it on to look after our own. So I'm just going to say, can you give me a pitch and, and give me one of the reasons why we don't keep everything local? Uh, I'll, I'll start with that one. I mean, if you look at something like, and it's a, it's a very good point, Deputy, and, and it comes back again to funding to an extent. So in Element uh, Films, Element Pictures, you've kind of got a, a, an international independent production company who are working at the highest level. Um, they So a lot of drama is co-produced, uh, so you have a number of parties who put money in. Um, now, they developed that particular uh, project with BBC. And again, it's because our finances have been so suppressed over the last five to six years that the level of drama we've been doing uh, has been way off what we actually want to be doing. Now, we're changing that now, but again, it means leveraging every euro we have from a licence fee point of view and putting that together with a partner abroad to tell an Irish story. So I think, you know, there is there is the funding mechanics part, which is, and most drama now, what you will find is co-produced. There are a number of parties from distributors, co-producers, other broadcasters involved. The most important part is that we are in a situation uh, financially where we can nurture talent in Ireland and then bring that story to the world. And as the public service broadcaster, we should be at the centre of that. We should be the engine of that. Uh, there's a price on that because you, you need to fund it. And, uh, but I think the reward is significant for all the reasons you put. And, you know, we all want to have pride in our own culture. You know, it's a very small country here. But if you look at the diversity of cultural output, it is so strong. Uh, so there's a massive opportunity for us as a country. Yeah, just to acknowledge uh, the point you make about the role of, of the LMFM and all of the others around the country and also the local papers, but I want to make something very clear. Unless there is a stimulus package for the industry, you will be looking at that to rose-tinted glasses in less than three years. And you will say, wasn't the Argus great? Wasn't the Independent great? Wasn't the Mead Chronicle wonderful? 
This won't praise alone won't butter parsnip folks, and that is something that we have to get clear to you. There is a crisis in the industry now. Some of it is because of uh, me, some media organisations not reacting in earlier in relation to investment in digital. There are reasons for this, but just to be clear, sentiment alone will not rescue the media. And, and you know, absolutely appreciate the compliments, but normal people in your constituency need local radio and need uh, need, 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 need need local papers. John. I'd support what Seamus says there and Adrian, it comes back to budget and how, how can we keep the show on the road and um, it isn't just COVID, we've been talking about the decline of radio uh, you know, local radio um, and our business model and television and local papers for years now, um, but it, it, this has brought it to an acute phase and nothing can be taken for granted for the future and like Seamus said um, I don't want to be in a position where people say, remember when we used to have a two-hour uh, talk programme on our local station in the mornings, um, but they couldn't afford to keep it going anymore. And they're done with scant resources, as is two or three people maybe at the most. Um, but it, it does come down to the resources. And put that in contrast with the, the we're, we're obliged by law to provide 20% news and current affairs, we're governed by legislation, we're regulated, we're monitored and so on. And yet the other um, online giants who, as uh, um, Shane Castle said earlier on, you know, is a very toxic environment and they don't um, face half the restrictions. So, I mean, we need action and it is very, very urgent. Thank you very much. I am now going to go to Senator Byrne. Uh, good morning, uh, Kirlick, and uh, thanks to the, uh, the three contributors. Uh, and I think I echo a lot of the comments that are made, and certainly uh, at a local level, uh, the contribution of South East Radio and the People Group of Newspapers, including my own, Gory Guardian, have, uh, has been excellent. I think particularly at this time, it shows the value of trusted news sources, uh, which is something that I, I, I do want to come back to. Uh, I also want to compliment RTE, and I, I, I know Kieran mentioned in terms of that lovely montage by Jackie Fox, uh, that I think you've got plenty of compliments on, but it's, it's deserved, uh, the, the, the piece with Joe Biden uh, re reading Heaney. Um, I certainly would also welcome RTE's continued support of the arts. You mentioned uh, the, uh, the All Ireland, uh, the Opera Festival, but I also talk about the All Ireland Drama Festival. Again, there's a clear commitment uh, to communities uh, there. I interestingly, just, just one comment before I move on to my main comment, and it's the point that John made around, uh, you know, regulation and so on. Um, if I wanted to take out a political advert, and we've been talking here about regulation of, of online political advertising, uh, I can't do it on RTE, I can't do it on local radio. Uh, it's regulated to the nth degree. Yet there is no problem with me or anybody else taking out lots of adverts on Facebook or indeed uh, actors from outside the state um, pumping in. So in terms of the context of uh, which, which I know we're going to be dealing with with the Electoral Commission, I, I believe that that uh, you know, outdated um, piece of legislation uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, and I would uh, certainly be quite happy. I might be able to afford RTE, but certainly in terms of looking at South East Radio, possibly taking, uh, taking some ads. M my, my point, and I, I might get all three to uh, refer, refer to this, which is, we're operating in a very different media and environment. Seamus, you'll accept it's not a battle between two local newspapers now, and similarly for, RT, for RTE. And I think we need to learn and look uh, internationally uh, into to what is happening. We have, and we might give out at times about our media here, but it's trusted news sources, it's balanced. We don't get the type of polarisation uh, that, we that we've seen in the United States. Uh, and I'm looking at kind of what is happening in media and, and some of the challenges. So for trusted media sources here now, particularly in the print industry, but in other areas, it, it's increasingly behind paywalls. We have to pay for it. And I'm conscious, you know, in the US, if you want to get the New York Times, it's behind a paywall. Yet Breitbart and a lot of these others uh, are, are all freely available. And it's about how do we ensure that we can continue to get people uh, to pay for trusted uh, content. The second, which is, uh, uh, and, and I, I'm conscious, James, your point on the windfall tax and so on, and you know, you'll be aware of what's happened in France and Spain when there were efforts to deal with this, what's happening in Australia to deal with this, and I do believe the social media giants need to be tackled at, at a global level. The second, I think, which is this question around, is around digital literacy and the role that the media have to, to play in helping people to interpret what is trusted news sources. You know, it shouldn't just be about Twitter saying, 
you know, this isn't this isn't good. I, I think there is a role for the media, also, by the way, in terms of explaining what we do as, as politicians, uh, but about the value of trusted news, about how it's checked, because the, the problem is, and Shane referred to it earlier, when we download stuff on our phones, uh, you know, there is no checking, there is no examination that's going on. So I, I, I guess my, my comment is, and all three um, might uh, refer to this issue about how we can ensure, because I think it's important, we've trusted media sources, we need to tell those Irish stories like normal people and those local news stories, but the environment we're operating in now is very different. I, I, maybe all three would... Within a minute. Within, yeah. as, as close as possible. I, it's a big issue, Chair, I, I know. know. Okay, um, first of all, I think my message would be from this committee is let's hope that despair and history rhyme and that you actually get the message from this. I think there is a need for uh, an investment in editorial resources and you need that from the industry. And they have to be able to... Without investment in editorial resources, media won't survive. People are not going to buy newspapers because they're good for democracy. On digital liter literacy, I believe that media have a responsibility, but I think also the education system has a responsibility. I think it's something that should actually be thought from a very early age at second level. Just on the, I mean, we'd be, we'd be well up for participating with partners in promoting digital literacy and so on, but I do think that that, that particular um, task should rest, rest with the people who are disseminating um, the digital inaccuracy and perhaps the people who are making the millions and billions from the misinformation and the fake news and scraping people's data should be actually called to account for that. Um, you know, we pride ourselves on, on the trust that radio is held in and television and newspapers. But there is a crisis uh, in the media, largely brought about by previously the disruption caused by the digital players where information can be scraped and abused uh, and so on, but now accelerated by uh, the pandemic. So I think in answer to your question, I think that, that particular question should rest not too far from here in some larger, large uh, companies. Yeah, um, we're very focused on that. We've been running a campaign called Truth Matters. Mm. Uh, integrity matters and uh, that was uh, obviously aimed at all audiences but with a real emphasis on 15 to 34s uh, because I was talking to our director of news yesterday and uh, as he was saying to me you know the pandemic is not only a pandemic in terms of the virus it's also a pandemic of disinformation mm. and uh, you know again I would say you know mm. people get their information from many different sources and I think one thing the pandemic has shown is that credible sources of information have a massive value for your society and culture. Thank you very much. I agree. Senator Byrne. Deputy Alan Dillon. Thank you very much. And uh, I was watching this from my monitor in my room, so apologies for, for being late. But um, I want to welcome uh, all our witnesses here today, John, uh, Seamus and um, uh, Adrian. Um, I suppose the, the pandemic has, has demonstrated the uh, importance of independent stations um, you know, national and regional newspapers and RTE and the unrivaled information service that is provided to, to its listeners and, and to, the, to the general public. Um, my first question uh, in, regards to the, um, in regards to RTE, and just to add to what Senator Castle said around the financial restructuring plan, um, it's due to conclude at the end of 2020, um, including a 15% pay reduction for the highest earning presenters and that was to save over 60 million in, in three years. Uh, my question is really, is what is the plan um, regarding senior management? And have they been excluded from this or, or in relation to their pay freeze? Um, what does the restructuring plan uh, define as senior management? In terms of senior management, the first thing to say is that the executive board of which I'm a member, we took a 10% pay cut uh, 12 months ago. Um, so... Uh, senior management, uh, I think there's maybe 121 managers in, in RT, something like that. Uh, so that pay is currently static. Okay. And, and you mentioned earlier on the 70 voluntary uh, 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 personnel who, who have um, looked towards an exit package. What's the expected cost of that? Or, or has there been a figure put around it? Uh, I'll have to ask the CFO for that. There is a figure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Seamus, just in relation to the to the six percent digital tax, um, uh, is there evidence to support uh, the implementation of this? And you know, has 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 there been 
know, sufficient information to, to call for this? Uh, well, I think what, what we do know is that currently the tech joints are paying nothing, that they rely for a great deal of their information that they have on their websites from the very people who, we, who I represent and who are represented here. Uh, and there has been support for this call from the NUJ from a number of countries. The tech giants are, of course, flexing their muscle. And in this country in particular, there is a certain degree of fear as to how they might react. But quite bluntly, we have to have the courage of our convictions here, and we have to say that you know, we we are, there is a limit to what the state is going to be able to provide. These people have very deep pockets. They are benefiting from our, and just as the labourer is worthy, worthy of the hire, so are the publishers and the broadcasters. Uh, and I think that we at least need an engagement with these people, and we need to say, what are you prepared to pay? They will, they will provide all sorts of philanthropic uh, schemes, and they will offer all sorts of schemes on their terms. And I think what, what all that does uh, is make them look good. But we're looking for is a more structured and formal process of engagement. Thank you. And just in relation to the independent stations, I know we had um, some good engagement with the Minister last week when she presented here uh, in regards to her priorities uh, within the, uh, her portfolio. I think it's crucially important that the independent radio stations are backed. I know in my own constituency in Mayo, Midwest Radio has performed you know, enormously uh, uh, positive um, over the, the last period, and I think the value of having a station who provides not just uh, government information but local uh, information to, 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 to thousands of people is very worthwhile. And you know, I, I look forward to the discussions on Monday, and I, I will be supporting, you know, whatever provisions that the minister can put in place in terms of recu re rescue package. Um, you know, the staff are working, you know, around the clock to disseminate information to, and I think it's it's very worthwhile that we, we do support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy Brendan Griffin. Yeah, um, thanks very much to our uh, three witnesses uh, for being with us today and uh, appreciate the time you've taken to, be, to, to come in to us. Um, I also, just for the record, I think it's important as well, uh, I, I may be mistaken here, but we have all of our broadcasters represented here um, through the IBI and through RTE, um, but Virgin Media Television Ireland part of IBI is that correct? So, yeah. So I just think it's important to state for the record that this, you know, as part of our work as a committee, perhaps the consultation with the other uh, TV station would be important as well. Uh, but I do thank uh, the, the three witnesses who, who've joined us. And um, John, I'm not sure if you saw proceedings from last week, but I think I, I don't want to repeat what I said yeah. last week. I think I've covered that ground in terms of my appreciation yes. of local radio and all of the work that has done, the outstanding work. And I certainly concur with previous commentators in relation to the package of supports that I feel are absolutely necessary Thank you. Uh, for uh, the stations that you represent right now for all of the reasons that have been laid out. So I'm not going to go over that, that old ground again, uh, but just to state for the record, you, you need your assistance and you, you're doing a fantastic job and all of the people you represent are doing a fantastic job. And Seamus, um, to, to concur as well, uh, with yourself, um, and I, I, I think we, we need to follow up, particularly in relation to the government public uh, health advertising and messaging. That seems an extraordinary omission on behalf of the state uh, for a sector that's crucial and that has so much penetration. So yeah. we, we need to do that. Um, I also, as well, um, maybe just is, your, your timing here is, is, is actually very important because in particular this week I've been dismayed by the huge amount of misinformation that is on line at the moment and the huge amount of fake news and if there's one thing that the, the last uh, the outgoing president of the United States left us is with that term fake news but there is so much of it out there uh, right now it is shocking um, and therefore um, democracy requires investment to protect re reliable verified sources and uh, and the people you represent to do that um, and it's incumbent on all of us to work um, to that end. Um, could I, could I just say to, to Adrian, and you're, you're very welcome, there's been a lot of uh, talk about normal people, but actually 
I think the return of the Dean has been a great tonic for this country. Um, and to see Zig and Zag and Dustin and Ray Darcy together on television uh, is, uh, is fantastic right now and uh, it gives a lift to loads of people. There was one kid watching it with tears in his eyes last Sunday night after Kerry were knocked out of the championship by Cork. And, uh, and it certainly made him feel better. That was just me, my two kids as well in our house were, were watching it too. Um, but uh, and one of the things that's fascinating actually is um, I, I, I've heard that a lot of the people who are watching it are now in their 50s and 60s. They were parents of young children at the time, when, when, which is a very interesting observation uh, when the din was forced on, the, on television. Um, but it, that's a really good departure, uh, and I think it's, it's something that's very positive right now at the moment for people. But actually, looking at the great content that's there in the archive, and I know this is a fresh attempt now at the din, it's very successful, and it's not always the case when people try to bring something back, but this has been a success from the start, as far as I can see. But like looking at, for example, Bachelor's Walk from 2002, Series 2 is on at the moment. People are loving it. Um, Pure Mule was shown during the first lockdown. Um, you know, we had um, other, other um, programmes like Love Hate um, that were shown. Um, there's, a, there's a very rich archive in RTE, and I think that this further um, delving into that archive um, could be you know, very, very much appreciated by, by the public, um, as, as well as obviously, of course, investment in, in new, new content as well. Uh, but I think that that's something that, um, that could be done. I know you have a very good archive online, but actually bringing it to more mainstream, particularly maybe to a demographic that aren't maybe online as much, uh, is, is something I think that this uh, would be important. Um, just to state, look, I think it's, it's critically important that we would invest again in, in, in the national broadcaster. Um, I still have, I have some concerns in, in relation to the, the over re, overall remit of the national broadcaster, um, where the private sector has filled, um, you know, I think what was originally uh, set out as, as, as being the only uh, show in town, you know, particularly as about looking at maybe the remit of 2FM uh, and looking at the competition that's there now. Um, you know, I wonder if, if there is room for rationalisation there, but um, I, I still think that there is a huge space there uh, and uh, you, you deserve further funding. So as part of this committee's work, we will continue to uh, to work for the um, in the interests of, of, of uh, public se se service broadcasting and, and, and um, verifiable and reliable news as well, because I think that is one of the key threats that we have uh, to this state right now. Uh, and it's right, happening right around the world, but it's very evident in Ireland, particularly in the last couple of weeks, and it, it's incredibly worrying. But uh, thank you all for the work that you're doing, and uh, as a committee, we'll continue our work as well. Thank, thank you. you. Can I move on to the next contributor? Yep, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Griffin. Senator Carey? Uh, thank you, Cahirla. First of all, apologies. For being late, um, I just had speaking in the Shannon Chamber, so uh, I just want to welcome you. Um, I just want to reiterate probably a few things that I mentioned last week, in particular in relation to, to local radio and local newspapers, and it's something I put forward for a work programme to look at, you know, the, the future of local radio, and um, I think the increased value that has been placed on it because of the pandemic in particular. Um, only last week we had a huge water outage in half of County Longford, where the people here was on your local radio station, otherwise people wouldn't know. But that's just a small thing, it? and I fully support any investment that goes in to maintaining um, local radios. I work with Shannonside as my local radio station, I think it's an invaluable asset. Got grilled many times on the political programmes, but um, fair criticism and that, but as I say, just to compliment them for the work that they've done, and have done over this period. And um, with local newspapers, um, I'm a retailer myself, or, um, I have a business at home, and I've seen the decline in the sale um, of the paper, so as I say, I would welcome the support um, to them, and I just want to compliment actually one of the local reporters in my own local paper, only today, uh, Liam Cosgrove, uh, won the local Ireland National Lottery Media Award for the newspaper story of the year, um, so I just want to compliment on that. Uh, just a couple of questions really for, for RTE, and I just picked up on, on, on something that, that, that you said. Um, 121 managers. Mm -hmm. um, it seems a high number for, 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 for an organisation. And, and it's about, I think, uh, I don't know the exact figure, it's probably like 8% of the total workforce, something like that. So, not so big. Managers, and what would be, say, an average pay grade? You said that there was no pay reduction taken at that level. Yeah, I'd have to. I'd have to ask the CFO to get you the the average. 
but I'll, I'll come back to you on that. All right. I have to say that we could ask them to write to the committee here and yeah. we can circulate that among members. Yeah. And just, just another question, and it's been debated a, a, a lot recently, is the whole thing of changing from the current TV licence to a, a broadcasting licence. And just what's your, your, your views on that? Um, I know the, the percentage rate of collection, I think, is about, or long collection, is about 13, 14%. And I know there's been a big right. push to move it away, say, from yep. being collected by, by on post. Um, so just just your views yeah. on I mean, it. In, in a way, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have a recommendation today of how it should be collected. What we know is it does need to be fixed. And um, I was saying earlier that there are, I think, about 140,000 no TV households and there's about 250,000 in the kind of avoidance. So it's quite a big number. And I think with, with all the representations from the different witnesses today, we know that if we fix that, and there's probably 50 million euros thereabouts there, you know, which will help us do many of the things we want to do. And I think there feels like to me there's strong consensus in this room you know, around the value of public media. And um, it's just something we have to, we have to do now. And uh, I was saying earlier, uh, Deputy, that there are other models around Europe in terms of, of how um, the licence fee is, is collected, you know. So we're not looking for a licence fee increase. We're just looking for effective collection. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And um, if, gentlemen, it comes to me to ask the final few questions, if that's OK. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank all three of you for your presentations here today. Um, I might begin with you, Seamus. I think you've made your uh, points loud and clear to this committee that, you know, talk is cheap and uh, that investment is what's required. And I think there is nobody in this room here doesn't appreciate the organisations and the journalists that you represent uh, here today. I know uh, for me, my local um, newspapers are the Anglo Celt and the Northern Standard. And Michael Fisher, I believe, is uh, heavily involved in your own organisation. And, um, you know, without those um, information media outlets, there would be a lot of um, houses very much dependent on that more than the Irish Independent or the national newspapers. They would very much rely on those for information. And I think the pandemic has given us all um, a new appreciation of, of, of our media and our traditional media outlets too. And I think the whole um, uh, American presidential uh, election has also given a new emphasis on what has been fake news and what has given that impetus. And I appreciate the campaign you have been running, Adrian, in terms of uh, real journalism and journalism matters. And I think that message is coming through loud and clear. And I think the public have become more aware of that uh, and are more, um, more, I suppose, reliant on those reliable, uh, credible um, sources of, of information that have been coming through. So. Um, John Northern Sound, Shannon Side Northern Sound, and I think, as my colleagues have said here today too, um, created where the vacuum was in terms of restrictions, in terms of the pandemic, in terms of people not being able to visit one another, people being lonely, people in their homes. You know, Northern Sound and stations like them right across the country certainly filled that vacuum. They created that support, that comfort, uh, and there is no doubt about it, there is a newfound appreciation for the local radio stations. And I think that the, the, the generational gap that perhaps was missing in terms of the younger generation have become more familiar with their local radio, perhaps their local paper too. Uh, and I know th that both Northern Sound and the Anglo Celt and Northern Sound have you know, brought their information online as well, and that has helped in terms of reaching that younger generation. But I think uh, the pandemic has, uh, has brought all of that to the fore too, in terms of our appreciation of it. I have a question specifically uh, for Seamus in relation to UNPUS and the delivery of newspapers, as some of my colleagues have alluded to during the restrictions, perhaps. Um, you know, some of the new ordinary newspaper outlets have been uh, closed down or whatever. But I'm just wondering, in terms of on post delivery of newspapers, have we any figures that kind of show us the um, impact that has had um, or not? Yeah, that's a question I think I wouldn't be able to answer. I know that it has been positive experience in some areas, but I think uh, news brands and local Ireland, they are the two representative bodies uh, who would supply that information. I know that some, new, some companies have been quite imaginative. I know of one newspaper group who actually arranged during the first wave of lockdown to have their newspaper delivered uh, through Meals on Wheels in order to ensure that the readers got the paper. And I thought that was imaginative. So I, 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 I but I, as I say, 
I don't have any more information on that. What I have the floor, just to say to you, I think one of the big issues that around the papers you talked about, they were owned by the O'Hanlons and the Smiths, and there's a great tradition of family ownership in regional newspapers, which meant that there was a public, what I call public interest journalism. We keep talking about journalism and public interest projects, casting or public service. There is such a thing as public service journalism. And I think that the public interest journalism or public service journalism that local newspapers and local radio do is, is sometimes overlooked. And I think our language around that is important. The, the you know, from local deaths to the, com the report on the local arts uh, festival is as much a public interest mm -hmm. as the, uh, as prime time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to get that out there, you know, and not everything has to be stuffy and not everything that's in the, the, the covers of a newspaper is public interest journalism. But in terms of democracy, mm -hmm. when local authority meetings are not covered or when they're, or when courts are co not covered, democracy suffers. And, and I think that, you know, I also would be critical, lest I should sound too uh, positive about newspaper owners. There is a history here of many of the larger companies not investing in journalism. And the quid pro for any kind of state aid has to be a real commitment to investing in journalism. And international companies coming in here, or companies coming in from the UK, who decide that they're going to sweep up and buy papers, there must be some process whereby there are commitments to investment in journalism. And, and quite frankly, the acquisition, the laws around competition, uh, the, this, the second phase of acquisition and competition authority, are simply not adequate. We're just not getting it. And the experience that Deputy McGrath spoke about earlier is proof of that. Thank you, James. A few specific questions uh, for Adrian, if that's okay. Um, Adrian, can you tell us, RTE, have, what their expenditure has been in the National Symphony Orchestra for the last three years and the savings that you have made or expect to make, to make when it leaves to the yep. National Concert Hall? Yeah, I think it's approximately... Now, there's, you've got to remember that we're losing some revenue here. It, it's about six million. It's in that. Six million yeah. annually that you are... Or that's the savings that you're going to be making? Annually. But there is some, I need to check the revenue figure because there are some ticket sales against that. Okay, so in terms of the expenditure that it has um, been, the cost it has been to RTE for the last three years, is that the six million figure yes. that you're giving me? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, what contribution will RTE be making to the future of the National Symphony Orchestra when it moves in terms of um, recording rights to the National Concert Hall? Yeah, so in terms of that, the, the, you know, we'll have an agreement with them because already, as you can see what I was talking about earlier, in terms of we're streaming the NSO over a three-month period. So we will be make sure that we are platforming their work uh, across our channels. Yeah. Okay, have we figure or anything like that around that now? Uh, no, but there will, that, that is being worked out at the moment. That's in process. Okay. Yeah. okay. Perhaps, again, you could maybe forward those kind of details yeah. to the committee following this meeting. Okay, thank you very much. And just, um, again, I'm just curious about some of the figures that you presented there today, um, like Senator Kerry. 120 managers. Um, I know that um, RT obviously have, I suppose, had a financial difficulty long yeah. before we had the pandemic, and obviously the pandemic has thrown more uncertainty in relation to that. Um, the redundancy scheme of 2017 promised a reduction of a headcount of about 250 yeah. to 300 people, if, if I'm correct in saying that. Where are we in terms of those figures now? Are we anywhere near the target, halfway yeah. there? As I was saying uh, earlier, that um, in terms of this, so in 19 we came out and we were looking for 200 redundancies. Yeah. So now between the NSO and these six years, 70 additional redundancies, we're now looking through through a, a voluntary programme. Um, so why is that a lower number? Uh, as I was saying earlier, part of that is because, you know, we, in order to deliver uh, all the services we currently have on air and to keep delivering them, particularly within COVID, we just can't afford to lose that many people or else we're going to lose content. And uh, we know there's an audience demand for the content that we're producing across all our channels. Okay, okay. So does that mean you're off, you're going to, you actually are having to change pathways in terms of your own targets in, in, in terms of your redundancies? Yeah, but I mean, uh, overall, in a way, you've got, I suppose you think about it, that we're looking at an overall figure that we need to save uh, over the period of the plan, and we're delivering that in the first 12 months, and we'll continue to deliver it over the next uh, two or three years. So a voluntary exit programme is only one element within that. Okay. And in terms of where your figures are now, my, yeah. my, my information would be you're at 1,800 staff. Is that, is that correct at the minute? Yeah. Yeah, it's 18, maybe a little bit more. Uh, again, I need to give you an exact figure, but yeah, 
Okay. Sounds right. Okay. Yeah. Would you mind just maybe forwarding sure. those exact figures as well yeah. to the committee uh, following our, our, our briefing here today? Yeah. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. Are there any other questions that the, the members wanted to ask? So Could I ask um, if there's any update in relation to the Limerick studio, the RT Limerick studio? Yeah. Um, obviously, for those of us in the in the southwest, midwest, it's it's re it's really important issue. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, you know, we committed last uh, November, or we actually clarified in a way that a that we weren't closing uh, Limerick down. And then B, in terms of those, the question of would we, because we're always looking for efficiencies in terms of how we deliver services, because we're in receipt of public money, you know, would we move elements uh, of the work uh, outside of Limerick? So what we're doing at the moment is we're holding off on any decision uh, around that until the commission has come back with its findings. So that's all. That's all in hand. Yeah. Okay. Anybody? Any other members? Senator Castles. Just um, on that last point that Seamus made in respect of um, public interest journalism, uh, national or papers that used to be family owned, that dynamic has changed massively in the last 20 years, massively. 20 plus years ago, most papers in Ireland, you could go around, you could identify the families that owned those newspapers and had done so for decades, if not going back to the uh, start of the 1900s. During the uh, the good times when everyone got high on sugar and bought up uh, newspapers because they saw them as vehicles to sell property supplements, which turned out to be bigger than the actual regional newspapers themselves. Uh, that's when we had trouble. And there was a slash and burn of newsrooms throughout this country uh, going back to 2007, 2008, 2009. And I just want to ask, Seamus, have we actually been able to uh, quantify how many regional journalists lost their job, which I, I, I'm guessing have not been from still staying in contact with people around the country. Uh, those newsrooms have not been uh, replenished. And on the point of the quid pro quo, and I want to really stress this, in terms, because we had the newspaper owners here uh, last year, uh, and I, I met with them, as, as, as I would, and every, every de deputy and senator did. Uh, most certainly, if government... Seamus and, and John have both made the point in terms of government standing, um, standing up to the plate here and, and looking out for the interests because we can't have local uh, media die because local democracy dies with it. But equally, I would make the point that if government stand up to the, to the mark, there has to be on behalf of news, radio owners and newspaper owners an investment in newsroom. There can't be a reduction in VAT and it is just to clear debt or, or, or putting into the coffers of those who are not family owned anymore, but are owned by, by corporates. Uh, and there's no investment equally in the newsrooms. And so I think that, I'm glad that Seamus has made that point, because I would make that point as well, that if, uh, if the ministers uh, do make an intervention in that space, that there has to be a commitment. And I would like to hear, so we've heard today, Cahirlock, uh, from those who represent the workers in terms of local media. There's a whole different um, other element to this debate, and that is the ownership of media as well. And Deputy Griffin has touched on that point as well in terms, in terms of, of, of a major player in the, in the broadcasting space. But that equally has to be discussed in this room from the point of view of their commercial uh, agenda. At the end of the day, they're businesses. Let's call a spade a spade. These people here today are to represent the journalists. The people who own the entities are trying to make money. And the best of luck to them, because if they don't make money, they don't survive. You know? But then we have to look at the investment in the newsrooms. And traditionally, for decades, there was very good investment. There was a passion to make sure that newsrooms were properly uh, resourced. But nobody's going to buy the local paper if it's full of fluff and it doesn't actually have the substantial elements that people want from it. And the editors can't do that unless they're resourced by their owners. And I'm sure the same applies in terms of uh, the newsrooms in local radio as well. Whether they can send a reporter to an event after hours, whether they can send a reporter to a sports event at the weekend. And so the owners of these um, radio stations and newspapers need to be as part of this discussion. Because at the end of this, I don't want to pat these people on the head and say, thanks very much for your time, goodbye. 
I want to be able to report back as a committee and say, in what substantial way is there going to be a significant change? These people cannot wait till next September. So what, in what substantial way can we help uh, the funding of newsrooms? But what are we as a, as, as a country actually going to get back? Where's the significant gain for the ordinary person buying that product or listening in uh, or tuning in at the end of the day? That's the real, because if we don't, if we don't address that here, it, it's been a waste of a conversation. Thank Thanks, you. Very much, uh, John. Well, just to make that uh, make it clear, I represent the owners of the radio stations. I'm an owner, uh, part owner of the radio station where I work myself, and we're not looking for handouts. I think the Sound and Vision scheme and the scheme that was put for uh, COVID shows uh, a model of how it can be done. So we submit a a list of program proposals and we say this is the programming that we will provide so we'll be able to cover council meetings we'll be able to cover this that and the other this is the amount of time that it will take this is the budget that we're allocating to it that we actually submit that budget that that budget is approved and then we submit a cost report at the end so it was verified so if public money is to be given for the support of public interest um, journalism on independent radio, we accept there needs to be transparency and I would submit that that has been there through the Sound and Vision special COVID scheme and through Sound and Vision in general. So we don't have an issue uh, with that. Um, a question I would like to ask the committee is that there is a lot of obviously appreciation of the, of the role of the, of the media across all its uh, um, spheres. How do we continue? I'm meeting the minister next Monday and then I don't want it to be that I come back in a year and a half and I just say yeah we've still got the same I think as Seamus said there is an urgency to this and we need to um, make sure that this isn't just a flash in the pan that we're coming in here and saying you know this is where we're at and then we just go off and disappear this needs to be the start of a process we look forward to engaging with the minister we're thankful for the opportunity here today but I just think this needs to be part of a process. I hope that answers your question from my point of view. Uh, yeah, on the, the question, I, I wouldn't even attempt a figure in relation to the, the titles that you talk about, but I think there is a reality. One of the big failures, in my view, is that successive ministers have not used the power of under the Competition uh, Act or Consumer Protection, the, the Amended Act, which allows, there's a two-tier approach. You First of all, you, the Competition and Consumer Protection Competition Authority says, is there a business case for referral? And then it goes to the Minister, and the Minister has a, check, uh, a, a list which actually does include editorial standards, resources, amendments, and we've had this in the, in the previous committee in relation to when Celtic Media was, was a, an attempted acquisition by independent news and media to acquire Celtic Media Group. What was interesting is that, that did, the Minister of the day did use that power. It came to this committee. Uh, in its previous form, and the committee interrogated it, and that act actually that deal eventually didn't didn't happen. In the case of iconic newspaper acquiring the Tullamore Midlands Tribune, the minister of the day did not exercise that right. The result of that then was that the committee didn't have the power to say, "What are you going to do with the future of two long-standing papers in Offaly? Is there going to be a synergy between Kil Leash?" And awfully, God bless us, in, you know, and, and then so in Kildare and then so in Tipperary and Limerick. That discussion didn't take place. You now have a situation where you can walk into Ross Grey and buy two different titles, competing titles, with the same story, the same headline, the same byline. How can you do that and expect the, the sector to thrive? The reality is that media diversity matters. Tipperary and Offaly, I say so as an Offaly man, are two different continents, you know, and uh, and there are different and, and different local authority areas, different sport interests, and and that 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 particular Midland thing I use because I want to know best. But, you know, which Senator talked about 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 Longford. The reality is that you know a member of the House of Lords came in, was allowed to buy up the Longford News. It's gone. The Roscommon Champion, where I used to be editor, it's gone. So, but acquired a, a paper in Athlone. It's gone. And, and, and part of that is because no one was listening. Uh, we, you know, I, I've said that we called for a commission you know, many years ago. Like, the ownership, and one of the reasons for this is actually politicians 
are very reluctant to take on people who buy ink by the barrel, by the gallon. That, that has been traditionally been the response. And politicians are nervous of newspaper owners. That, that, has always been, uh, that, that, that has always been an issue. There was a lack of political will, and I think we're now paying the price for that. I don't think it's too late. I think that we can look at funding models, uh, but if we don't do it soon, we can look for assistance, but if we don't so soon, it will be late, and we will all regret it. And obviously, I'm a vested interest. I, I'm unashamedly here because of uh, the fact that I represent journalists. But I also know, as a former regional newspaper editor, that the local newspaper and the local radio station are the heartbeat of the community. I also represent workers in RTE, and it is great to come to a meeting of this committee and not have a whinging session because RTE is the you know is a very easy target and God knows I, I criticise Adrian and his colleagues frequently in negotiations but on this one we're on the one page and I think if ever you were to reform the licence fee system now is the time to do it because there is a public understanding that nothing comes for nothing and if we have a future pandemic and we don't fund public service broadcasting properly, and we don't address it, don't assume that the same, that, that the same service will be there. Because it can't. The model, the model R RTE has actually delivered a quality service despite the funding model. I don't believe that that can happen, that can continue. It just, it, it's, you know, there, there is a real issue here about the public service uh, re remit, and I think that in the same way as local radio stations, there's only so long before you can stretch an elastic band. It does eventually break. No, Seamus, we will bring our deliberations today to a conclusion. Um, I would personally like just to mention uh, Sinead Hussey. She's new, not a new correspondent, but she's new to the North East. And I know, I think there was a time there we didn't have anybody. And that's made a huge difference to uh, board, the border region, the border area. And she does drill down. And also Sinead Crowley, her coverage of the arts, I think, has been outstanding. And they've been an area, of course, that has suffer, suffered hugely during the pandemic as well. And I'd just like to, to ask you to pass on our thanks to them too. To all of our... our just, just before you wrap up there, just on, on, on John's um, reference there to, um, to a process arising from today, just as a committee, I suppose, could we agree that we, we would monitor and, and agree to re-engage following the meeting next week uh, in relation to the IBI issues? I think that would be advantageous to everybody because yeah. we all and agree. And also, Deputy Griffin, in our, our meeting previous to this, we decided on having another day to work, um, devoted yeah. to media as well, and I think that will be an ample opportunity for us to continue this, and yep. as you say, not to have a, just a once-off meeting to actually do something with it, and to be the beginning of a process, John, and thank you very much for that uh, suggestion. It could possibly be written to the committee following on from that meeting so that it remains on the agenda. It's not just... But that, that then report is actually discussed by by members, and it can provide the platform for re-engagement after this as well. That's a good suggestion. Good suggestion. So thanks very much to our witnesses for being here today. Thank you to our members for all your very positive contributions, insightful ones too, and for being so good in terms of timing. Um, just to ask you to wipe down your seats and all the rest, and I ask everybody if they could vacate the room. No harm in having a discussion outside in the lobby, but we have to vacate this committee room to allow um, for the next meeting. And I am going to adjourn our meeting uh, to Wednesday, the 18th of November, at 1 o'clock in a private session on Teams, and then 2 o'clock here in our committee meeting room to meet with representatives from Sports Ireland. Thank you very much. Thank you.